So hi, I'm Chris Lukenbiel. Let's take a look at marginal elements in the relationship to legends now. And we're going to look at different types of legends as they're related to different map types. So that because you'll come across different issues. So the first one that we're going to look at is a choropleth map. And they usually show density by area is what choropleths are tied to. So often we'll see varying degrees of saturation within color or pattern thickness. So that we're looking at quantitative types of visual variables. So data ranges and visual variables need to match sequential or divergent color schemes. And by this I mean that we have a sequential color scheme when we have numbers going from low to high, or we'd have, and we don't have one up here, a divergent scheme is when there's an average or a zero in the middle and data is going out either way from it. So we have to think of different kinds of color schemes. And we did that with the uh, Color Brewer in, in JST 214 as well. A second issue that you'll come across with Core Plus is, do you show all the numbers or not? That notice in this one, we have zero to a thousand in the numeric scheme and all numbers are represented. In this one, we actually break it so that there's no data. Oh, no, it doesn't break. That you can break it and not represent all numbers, but only represent the numbers that are present. And this one also begins at 92 and ends at 313, which could seem kind of odd, but that would be the lowest value in the data, and that would be the highest value in the data. So the, the, it's only showing the data that's present. So legends on a qualitative map can be very different than legends on a, on a quantitative map. They're, we're looking at descriptive labels, and so you're going to be using visual variables tied to qualitative um, data. So colors or patterns on the map must match up. So we can see it's, it's that apples and oranges, you know, the, the greens under construction, purples are siding. But this is one of my maps that I did of San Diego, and it has a very distinct um, color scheme going on here, where the colors themselves, red is representing one year, green is the second year, blue is a third year, purple is a fourth year, and then there's two qualitative sites, Stu Seagal Productions and the Marina Village Conference Center. And if we critique this map, there's an error on it. And it's an error in, in value where the, the legend value, note, I have a yellow star here, does not match the legend value down here. And I luckily corrected that before it went to press. So legend on a dot map can, are very different because we're looking at dot density. So it, we need to define what does one dot represent? What amount does it represent? So one dot represents 1.000000, or down here, each square represents 100 square kilometers and what it looks like how, with how many dots present inside that square. So dots are intended to show a density or a feeling of density um, that they're, we don't really, we're not really looking to find out quantitatively exactly where those things are taking place, but we want to get a feel for it. Like where is the tobacco, most of the tobacco grown in the southeastern United States? We can really get a feel of the dominance of the Carolinas and Kentucky areas for tobacco growing. And that's the idea behind the dot map. Legends with ISO lines on them, or if you want to think like weather maps, um, you need to state the ISO line interval value. So this is off of a topo map, where literally it just says contour intervals equal 20 feet. And we, we need to be able to know that because we know, want to know how much um, difference in elevation height that we're looking at or in terms of uh, weather, and how much difference in temperature variation is going on. And we have to decide how much uh, information do you want to show with your ISO lines. Like, if we're doing contours, we have our contour intervals, but there's different types of lines that can be used, like hashers. 
that showed depressions going downward rather than upward by the little lines pointing inward. We can also, with isolines, instead of just doing the lines, we can represent difference by the use of color. And you've probably all seen with elevation maps how blue's for water, and then the top of a mountain is white, symbolizing like that there's snow up there. So legends with proportional symbols, um, we can think of different examples of how the form of the symbol itself can vary in size, by square, by circle, by triangle. We can make them look flat, two-dimensional, or like on the Seattle map, they can be round and um, more three-dimensional in shape. We're usually thinking of smallest to largest, um, and the size of small being the smallest and the largest um, being at the bottom or at the top of the legend, if you will. And we always want to show the height of the highest and lowest value in the data range, but we need to have at least one, two, if not more, in between values so that we can get a feel for what the different types of variation looks like on a map. So you have to be kind of careful too with the clarity of the map. So it's always good to try different sizing and to feel if it's gotten too big or if you can find the smallest symbol on the map. Um, and getting that data range just right is um, very important. So take a look at a couple different examples here on the proportional symbol sizes. And notice one of the problems of designing issues, and this is just somebody's map I stole off the internet, um, where the smallest one is starting to disappear, and the biggest one is creating a monstrous size legend. So one way to get around this issue is by doing these nested symbol sizes and associations tied to them, and then you get a much more concise one. But maybe you don't have quite as many um, in-between sizes, like if we took one of these out, like that one right there, if we took it out, we'd have a decent legend size. But doing this can be very useful in terms of cutting down your legend size.